an entrepreneur should be taught. That is, most of you here in the audience probably are entrepreneurs already, uh, but many of you could be aspiring entrepreneurs, may want to become entrepreneurs, and you'll be surprised that I've been dealing with the likes of you for the last 15 years. Um, now, I have also been practicing entrepreneurship, and I have been building companies here in Spain and around the world. So I'm one of those professors that uh, teach and also uh, I walk the walk, let's say. And so building companies is something that is hard to teach, right? How do you teach a person to turn an idea into a company? Or how do you, so for example, in the case of Fawn, I had the idea of Fawn because I had been faced with a 2,000 euro roaming bill while visiting the city of Paris, and I didn't want to get mugged again. And so I was looking at all the Wi-Fi signals in Paris, and I was seeing that there were so many Wi-Fi signals, but that they were all locked. They were locked and locked and locked and locked. So at that moment, what is the difference between a person who says, screw this, I can't connect, and a person who says, there may be a business here? Okay, what is the, and nobody's going to teach you that ability. It is an ability that you either have, you recognize in others, which is what I do when I invest, I recognize this ability in other people, or you are blind. So what for other people may be a frustration, for an entrepreneur may be the moment of birth of an idea, right? So many people are just left with a frustration that they cannot access any Wi-Fi. Of course, my first instinct was that of a cracker. How can I crack the passwords of all these people and just use their Wi-Fi, okay? But because I've been retrained from being a cracker to being an entrepreneur, I try to think of sustainable ways of achieving a solution, right? And so the, the question really that I've been asking myself after teaching entrepreneurship for so long is what really is an entrepreneur? And I remember when I was at school at Columbia University, there was a famous right-wing American politician who wanted to ban pornography. And they asked him, but how do you define pornography? And he said, Look, I don't know how to define pornography, but I recognize it when I see it, okay? And I, and I have a similar feeling about entrepreneurship. I don't know how to define entrepreneurship, but I recognize it when I see it. And sometimes it has the same excitement as pornography. Now, the question is, how can you get turned on by an opportunity, right? How can an opportunity turn you on, right? So I would say that some people are deaf to entrepreneurship or blind to entrepreneurship, or they just never see an opportunity. These people are just not turned on by entrepreneurial opportunities. And people who are not turned on by entrepreneurial opportunities, people who do not recognize entrepreneurial opportunities, people who do not see the pornography, should not be taught entrepreneurship, okay? It is not that you can turn anyone into an entrepreneur because you can't. But if you ask entrepreneurs, you will see that many entrepreneurs went through bad times and learned. So there must be something about entrepreneurs that they learn, and if they learn, they can be taught, right? So you have a subset of the population that you shouldn't even try to turn into entrepreneurs. But there's another subset of the population that could greatly improve. And the wisest entrepreneurs actually have mentors or people who teach them how to be better entrepreneurs. 
It is interesting that most of entrepreneurship is not taught at business school. Like, here's a list of some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, and none of them have an MBA. Many of them went to school, but they went to school to study different things. So it's not that entrepreneurs shouldn't be educated. It's that entrepreneurs don't necessarily need to get an MBA. Now, it happens that when I teach at Columbia or at NYU, I demand that my students come from the whole university. I say, I don't want to teach only to people who say they want to do an MBA. I don't want to teach to people who only want to study business. Because business is not the process by which you create a company. Business is a language that involves accounting, finance, marketing, and everybody should learn that language. And these guys have learned this language very well. But if you don't have a background in something deeper than the language of business, you will talk business, but you will not be business. Okay, so there is something engineering, medical sciences, deep design, creativity. There has to be something that comes from below into the business atmosphere. So I get very good results mixing MBA students with non-MBA students, and especially generally engineering students or students in the medical sciences. So the, the, the key about entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs learn by doing. They learn by doing. They learn from their mistakes. They learn by doing. They have a razor sharp focus on whatever it is they're doing. They're obsessed with what they're doing. I mean, when I helped uh, Zuckerberg launch in Spain, I think it was 2007, that he launched Facebook in Spain, in Madrid, in this theater I used to own, El Teatro Lara, and, and they asked me for help. Uh, to launch Facebook in Spanish, I spent the first day of my life with him. And what surprised me about Zuckerberg is his obsession, basically, with his product. That's all he would talk about. So after four, year, four hours, I said four years, it felt like four years, four hours of talking about Facebook, I was ready to throw up, and I, I just wanted to talk about something else. So the next day was the Obama election, right? So I guess that will tell us when this happened. And so I say to Mark, Mark, what do you think about Obama? He says, you know what? We got him on Facebook, <laughs> right? Uh, it's just like, you know, it's like, OK, I give up, you know. But he's a genius. Right? And Facebook is amazing, right? So I devised a method to teach entrepreneurship, and this is the method I'm going to share with you. And it's a method that cannot be practiced unless you have at least 20 people playing this game. It's a game, it's a simulation. It's a simulation of the real world. So it requires a minimum amount of people joining a class and playing this game. So one of the elements that I find annoying when I was a student, or when I still am a student because I still study things, is that, I mean, think of somebody who says, oh, this weekend, I have so much to study. Now, think of the same person saying, hey, this weekend, I have so much to learn, right? So, study or learn, right? Just, I have so much to learn. What is the psyche of the person who says, I have so much to learn, right? So, I created a game where your ignorance pops up, right? Where your ignorance emerges as a result of the game, and you want to learn because you want to play the game, which is a technique much more used in iPad games than in Columbia University or NYU. And so what I do is I, I give the students 
a million dollars of some kind of unicoin that I created. So think of Bitcoin, virtual currency. Think of professors. Professors have a currency, the currency to give you a good grade or a bad grade. That is my currency as a professor. And I decided to issue these unicorns that the university gives me. So the university gives me the ability to grade my students. And the first thing I do, the first day of class, is I give up the right to grade my students. I issue a currency that I distribute equally, one million of these unicorns to every one of my students. And I say, from now on, I am not the one who will grade you. This will be a marketplace in which unicorns will trade during this class. And at the end of the class, whoever has the most unicorns will get the A. Okay? So I divest from day one in the class, which other professors taught me would be very dangerous because then nobody would pay attention to me. But that hasn't yet happened. They, pay, they may not pay attention to me, but they certainly pay attention to their classmates who have the money to buy their grade. Um, so they do investment rounds. And then these investment rounds in this marketplace that happens at class, what, what happens is students do what students would do if they became entrepreneurs. For example, I make them make a Kickstarter video or I should have said an Indiegogo video after the last presentation. I make them make a video of their product, a video of a product which is now such a normal way to start a business, like Blue Smart that was shown before, is companies that are getting started. Even our own company phone went to use Kickstarter for the gramophone because we wanted the knowledge that these platforms give you other than the money. So they have to do a Kickstarter-like video. They have to do elevator pitches. And after these things happen, I call on them to make investments. And the, and the trading starts. And the companies go up and down in value, depending on how good they are. So you would say, well, where, where is my teaching, right? Where is my teaching? What am I like? a TV, you know, shark tank type of person who shows up at the university. No, there is teaching. But the teaching is like a commercial interruption. What happens is somebody says, because I'm going to give a very generous stock option plan, which the MBA student understands, but the first year engineering student that I also have in my class doesn't understand. I can see it in her face or his face. And so I stop the class and I say, who feels uncomfortable with an, the concept of a stock option plan? Do you know how a stock option plan works? A few people don't know. So I said, OK, commercial interruption. Stock option plan tutorial. So when I teach, they wanted to learn. There was a moment of ignorance. To me, universities are restaurants who feed people when they are not hungry. I want to feed people when they're hungry. OK? That is the big difference, is you generate a hunger in the student, and then you teach him. Because the student has a need, because the student at that moment feels awkward, ignorant, handicapped, but happy, eager to learn, wants to go further. So that is the magical moment when you teach. It's when they wanted to know. And these tutorials are the same tutorials that are taught in any entrepreneurship class. I teach them about pre-money and post-money valuations. By the way, I know founders who've raised a ton of money, and they still haven't understood pre-money and post-money valuations. It's like insane, the ignorance that sometimes surrounds the entrepreneurial community. Of course, entrepreneurs need to learn, but they need to learn when they need to know. And that's what I create. 
For example, stock options. Stock options is something that people are very confused about. In fact, the tax authorities of Europe are very confused about what stock, stock options are. It is, I tend to explain stock options using an analogy similar to Olympic jumpers and hurdles and explain that in an Olympic jump, if you don't jump the base height, you fall on your ass and your stock option is worthless because a stock option is a hurdle. Okay, and I try to use a lot of visual analogies to explain. Uh, now, the, the key about teaching entrepreneurship is that you, the professor, are not the most important person in the class. For example, when I studied my MBA at Columbia University, I studied with Miguel Salis, a friend with whom later on we built Jastel together, we built Ya.com together, we built Eolia together, and we still cycle every week, we're best buddies. I thank Columbia University for Miguel Salis. I don't even remember the name of the professor who taught that, that class. I know that I'm much less relevant than the classmates. And you know what? Classmates is the only reason why people go to university. Because if not, you would stay at home and use Udacity or all these other universities online, and you just wouldn't go to university. But you know what happens when you don't have classmates? You don't do shit. I mean, what happens is people without classmates don't do anything. It's classmates that make you want to do things. People, it is, it is, if you look at the apps, when people say a university is doomed, people seem to, seem to believe that the most important thing in a university is a professor. And they say, hey, universities are doomed because professors are irrelevant. You can, I can go online and listen to their lecture. And I say, universities are not doomed. The universities will not disappear. But it's not thanks to the professors. It's thanks to the classmates. It's thanks to your buddies. It's thanks to everyone else who's in the same situation as you. That's why universities are relevant. So in my class, I am not relevant. I don't give grades. It's a currency system that's trading. It's the students who grade each other. That's why I can teach entrepreneurship. Because the people who start in my class make friendships and partnerships and build businesses. And now I have a track record because I've been doing this for quite a while. I get the most unusual projects in my class. And so there's a Facebook group that people who have been to my class join this Facebook group, and they keep showing projects to each other. A remarkable one by Rashid Dar, this Muslim student I had, is it's kind of like a... So he presents in class, and he says that Muslims in Western societies have an, a problem that I certainly hadn't heard about, and most of you who are not Muslims probably haven't heard about, but some of you who are Muslims may have heard about this, which is that somehow praying in public is embarrassing for Muslims in Western societies, because to stand in La Plaza de Catalonia, La Plaza de España, whatever, and pray and just do the praying, so Muslims in Western societies tend to hide in places provided by other friendly Muslims so they can pray in, in private, right? And so Mosala is a startup that gets, I don't want to call it the Airbnb of praying Muslims, but it's kind of like that, okay? So there are unusual and yet super interesting projects, you know, that come out of the, uh, come out of the class. And the class also creates a capital shortage like, every student needs five million, but has one million. Why? Because the university doesn't give me the opportunity to give every student an A. So I cannot give five million to every student, and then they cannot invest in themselves. So I simulate the shortage in A's, or tens, or if anyone is German in this audience, of ones, which in Germany is the best grade, uh, which kind of makes sense, your numero uno, right? But anyway, uh, I create a shortage of good grades that is similar to the shortage of capital, that is similar to what the university tells me, because the university forces me to grade people on a curve. 
Okay, so this is not exactly my idea. And the system democratizes grading because the professor never knows the students as well as the students know each other, okay? I encourage the students to invite each other for a beer, for a cafe, for whatever, they get to know each other. And by the way, this idea I had because I read a, a study at Harvard that they had an audience like this one made of students who knew each other. And they asked them, who's going to succeed in life? They all raised their hand. And then they said, please stand up and point to the person that is most likely to succeed in life. They stood up and they all pointed to the same people. So the students somehow knew who the most likely to succeed in life were. When I read that, I'm saying, hey, I'm going to implement this with sort of a virtual currency system. I, okay, I made it more sophisticated, but it wasn't my idea, I read it. Uh, and so, the learning that goes on in my class, that's called the entrepreneurship game, you can Google it, by the way, Warsawski entrepreneurship game, is very similar to the, the process that goes on in real life. And it has led to companies that happen in real life. So for example, one of, uh, one of the companies that I, I like the most that has come out of my class and by the way, I don't invest in my students because I don't want my students to take my class so I become an investor in their, in their companies. So I invest with them, but only two years after they took my class. So if they have patience enough and I am interested, then I invest with them. So two years after Elizabeth de los Pinos, and I brought this example because she's great, but I also brought this example because she's from Barcelona. Elizabeth de los Pinos took my class at Instituto de Empresa in Madrid. She just raised over 20 million for her startup to cure cancer, to cure ocular melanoma. And she was a biologist, a scientist, who did an MBA in order to become a biomedical entrepreneur, which is what she is now. And so this class not only mimics life, but sometimes is life. 